Ladies and gentlemen, it's a woman I've been waiting to talk to for a very long time, Michelle Alexander. I just picked up her book. In fact, it was just delivered yesterday to New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness. Angela Davis will be proud of you, Michelle. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me on. She would be proud of you. I was watching your videos all last night. I want to play something for you, something you said at one of your seminars, and get your response to this. So this is Michelle Alexander, the recent event she had, talking about her book. Now, most Americans violate drug laws in their lifetime. Most do. It's what the research shows. But the drug war, not by accident, has been waged almost exclusively in poor communities of color, even though studies have consistently shown now for decades that contrary to popular belief, people of color are no more likely to use or sell illegal drugs than whites. In some states, 80 to 90 percent of all drug offenders sent to prison have been one race, African American. So why declare a drug war at a time when drug crime is declining and the American population isn't much concerned about drugs? Well, the answer is that from the outset, the drug war had relatively little to do with genuine concern about drug addiction or drug abuse, and nearly everything to do with politics, racial politics. What did you mean by racial politics, Michelle? Well, numerous historians and political scientists have now documented that the war on drugs was part of a grand Republican Party strategy known as the Southern Strategy, using racially coded get tough appeals, political appeals on issues of crime and welfare to appeal to poor and working class whites, particularly in the South, who are anxious about, resentful of, fearful of many of the gains of African Americans in the civil rights movement. And pollsters and political strategists found that thinly veiled promises to get tough on a group not so subtly defined by race could be enormously successful in persuading poor and working class whites to defect from the Democratic Party and join the Republican Party in droves. It was part of the effort to flip the South from blue to red, this get tough rhetoric. And so when President Ronald Reagan declared his drug war in 1982, it was an effort to make good on campaign promises to get tough on a group of people that had been defined in the media and the political discourse as black and brown. And this drug war... Uh, has been devastating for our communities. The enemy in this war uh, has been defined in the public consciousness and within law enforcement as poor folks of color in the hood. Um, But as, you know, that clip (laughs) uh, emphasized, you know, all of the research, all of the data has shown consistently that people of color aren't any more likely to use or sell illegal drugs than whites, but it's been almost exclusively poor folks of color who have been doing time for drug crime in the United States. The clips that you heard were from Michelle Alexander, author of the book, uh, New Jim Crow. Why why did you write this book? Well, really, because I wanted other people to have the same awakening that I finally did, that, you know, our criminal justice system functions more like a system of racial and social control than a system of crime prevention prevention. Uh, or control. And, you know, as I describe in the introduction to the book, there was a time when I rejected comparisons between mass incarceration and slavery or mass incarceration and Jim Crow and thought those were exaggerations, you know, or distortions, and that people who are making those kinds of claims are actually doing more harm than good to efforts to reform our criminal justice system and achieve greater racial equality. But After years of working as a civil rights lawyer, representing victims of racial profiling and police brutality and investigating patterns of drug law enforcement and trying to assist people who have been released from prison, you know, quote unquote, re-enter into a society when our legal system has authorized discrimination against them for the rest of their lives and voting and employment and housing and access to education and public benefits. You know, I came to see that our criminal justice system now functions more like a caste system than a system of crime prevention and control, and that once you're branded a felon, um, you're ushered into a parallel social universe in which all these 
forms of legal discrimination and exclusion that we supposedly left behind during the Jim Crow era um, are suddenly legal again. Uh, we haven't ended caste in America. We've just redesigned it. Something else that you say, we're talking to Michelle Alexander, the author of the book, The New Jim Crow. Uh, here's another comment that she made during a recent event talking about her book. It was President Bill Clinton who escalated the drug war far beyond what his Republican predecessors even dreamed possible. And it was President Clinton that championed laws denying federal financial aid to drug offenders for college. It was President Clinton who championed laws banning people with criminal convictions from access to public housing so that people wouldn't have housing upon release from prison. It was the Clinton administration that championed laws denying even food stamps. Oh, no, you did not say Clinton. Not the first <laughs> black president. You didn't say that, did you? I find it highly ironic that, you know, Bill Clinton, um, you know, has been celebrated as our nation's first black president. Right. When, you know, he is, his administration is largely responsible for the escalation of the drug war and so many of these rules and laws, policies and practices that now constitute, you know, the basic structure of this caste system, the legal system that keeps people locked into a permanent second class status for life were championed by a Democratic administration desperate to win back all those so-called white swing voters. So he wanted to play tough. Absolutely. He wanted to prove that he was even tougher than the Republicans, prove that he could be tougher than Reagan on those people. Um, you know, the dark-skinned folks living in the hood. Now, you know, I think it's important to emphasize that, you know, there were plenty of, of black folks, plenty of even some civil rights leaders who were, you know, calling for get tough measures as well um, during that time period. But what I think is important for people to understand is that those folks, black folks, weren't just asking for get tough measures when their communities were erupting in violence. They weren't just asking for get tough measures. They were also asking for good schools. They were asking for job creation, for economic investment in their communities. But you know, what we have seen over the years, that the only thing that folks of color ask for and get are police and prisons. And that's all that the Clinton administration, the Reagan administration, successive administrations have been willing to give poor folks of color, uh, you know, police and prisons. Uh, and, you know, the result of this, you know, abandoning the war on poverty and declaring a war on drugs, uh, is the creation of a vast new undercast, not class, cast, millions of people uh, who have not only been locked up, but who are permanently locked out out of the mainstream society and the legal economy. So the, re the result of all of this getting tough that you said, how does that reflect on the people who are listening to this show right now? How do we feel the impact of that getting tough? The well, average person <laughs> listening right now. Well, the average person listening right now um, has felt the impact of getting tough in many, many ways. You know, if you're African-American, someone in your life and your family has likely been affected by mass incarceration. In many large urban areas, the majority of working-age African-American men have criminal records today and are thus subject to legalized discrimination for the rest of their lives, forced to check the box on employment applications, legally denied access to housing, perhaps even denied access to, you know, aid for schooling, um, access to college. Um, you know, this affects large majorities of our communities, not some small segment um, of our communities. People talk about, you know, the decimation of black families. Well, the mass incarceration of black men is a major contributor <laughs> Uh, to, you know, the absence of, you know, fathers in the home. Not only are so many of them locked up, but once they get out, they find it nearly impossible to find work, to provide housing, to provide for a family. And the majority cycle in and out of prison sometimes for the rest of their lives. Um, you know, there are countless ways in which mass incarceration has impacted our communities and families. And what I think is a shame is that so many of us have bought into the myth, 
have bought into the myth that these get tough policies are actually making us safer. We've bought into the myth that, you know, poor black folks are more likely to use and sell drugs than people of other races, even though college campuses are awash in drugs, even though middle class white communities um, have as much drug dealing and drug use in them as poor black communities. The reality is, is that, you know, a young black kid living in the hood, he deals drugs for different reasons than a white kid on a college campus. He may be dealing drugs to help his mama pay rent, dealing drugs so he can buy some shoes for himself and his little brother, dealing drugs to just get by, whereas the white college student who's dealing drugs is dealing drugs so he can have some extra cash to party with. We're talking to Michelle Alexander right now, the author of the book, The New Jim Crow. I'm reading the book right now. I'm going to be taking it with me um, on my flight down to Atlanta. I'm going to be talking to Clark Atlanta University. I got my little highlighter with me. What would you like for me to share with the students about this material? Well, I think what I hope is that people will actually read the book from start to finish, because at the end of the book, I focus on what we're going to do about this. You know, it's one thing, you know, to talk about it, and it's important for us to talk, for us to wake up and to have an awakening about this. But at the end of the day, we have to be willing to take action. And my own view is that nothing short of a major social movement has any hope of ending mass incarceration in America. I mean, if we were to go back to the rates of incarceration we had in the 1970s, before the war on drugs and the Get Tough movement and all that kicked off, We'd have to release four out of five people who are in prison today. Wow. A million, yeah, a million people employed by the criminal justice system would lose their jobs. You know, private prison companies would be forced to watch this, their profits just vanish. You know, this system is so deeply rooted now in our social, political, and economic structure, it's not going to just fade away until we not only wake up, but are willing to take action and build a movement for education, not incarceration, for jobs, not jails, a movement to end all these forms of legal discrimination against people released from prison that lock them into a permanent second-class status yeah, you, for life. Michelle, what, did, how, what happened to you? What happened to you to get you on? I mean, really, because something happened to me to get me on this path. I mean, I, I started reading a lot of different kinds of books. What happened to you to get you on this path? Well, I have to say, you know, part of it is that when I was working as a civil rights lawyer and advocate, I had an experience, well, a number of experiences, the one in particular that involved a, a young African-American man who I was considering representing in a racial profiling case as a named plaintiff against the Oakland Police Department, a racial profiling case we thought about filing. And when he told me he had a felony record, I told him I couldn't represent him mm -hmm. because of his felony record. Um, I knew that, you know, we couldn't represent someone with a felony record without law enforcement arguing, well, of course, you know, we should be stopping and searching mm -hmm. people like him. He's a felon. And I knew we couldn't put him on the stand without him being cross-examined for an hour about his prior criminal history right. and his credibility under my Is that allowed? To cross-examine someone about the I mean, prior about their prior history? criminal history. Absolutely. Really? Yeah. Even if Absolutely. it's irrelevant to that particular case or charge? Well, they would consider it relevant if, you know... If it's related. The, yeah. yeah. It's and related. Uh, so I told him I couldn't represent him, and he tried to explain that the only reason he had a felony record is because he had been set up, and the police had planted drugs on him and framed him, and I didn't believe him. And to make a long story short, I later came to find out that he had been telling the truth. And that, you know, when the Oakland police writer scandal broke and it turned out a gang of police officers, hmm. otherwise known as a drug task force, had been planning drugs on suspects and How about folks up. You know, I began to have an awakening that there is a whole reality <laughs> out there um, that even people like me, people who are civil rights lawyers and advocates, people who claim to care, have been blind to, that we have been unwilling to see a truth about how the system is functioning in our communities, uh, a truth that is hidden right there in plain sight. Well, And uh, that was really the beginning of my journey. I'm looking forward to having you back on the show. If there's anything else that you want to reach out to us about and that's happening that you think we need to know about, please reach out to the show and let us know. I'd love to have you back on. Oh, thank you so much. Thank where are you, you out of? Where do you, where do you live? What city? I live in Columbus, Ohio. Oh, too bad. And see, that's one of the cities we're not on. You would have been hurting us banging away a long time ago. <laughs> But congratulations on the book, and I'll be sure to spread the word. All right. Thank you.